Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, I, w I want to build on some a few things that have been said before. So obviously, DNA uh, holds a code uh, for each cell. This is then read, and it's, that's a process that takes about 20 minutes to turn the information in the DNA in, into proteins. And then uh, the proteins diffuse quite quickly within one cell and interact with each other. Th that's that, that what, so one of those very complicated, ne complicated networks. And it's, it's fantastic the complexity of the interactions that can happen between those proteins. It's not even one-to-one, -one, it's often complexes of proteins. So, so e even more complexity. And those of you fam familiar with coding um, can, can for sure understand how many agents are at play even within one cell. And then cells talk to each other, exchanging both proteins and other small molecules. And that makes uh, the complexity at, at the level of uh, uh, groups of cells, i.e. tissues, uh, again at another level. Now, now the timescales uh, build up on this. And, uh, and you saw the pitcher plant in, in the previous talk uh, that develops over several days, uh, its pitcher. And the same happens in, uh, say, in mammals when they go from a small embryo duplicating from one cell to to, to many cells in a whole organism, that also takes many days. So you see, uh, there, there are processes that take uh, diffusion within one cell um, can take just a few seconds. That, that's a very fast process, and also protein interactions happen at that time scale of a second or even less. Um, and then you have processes that take about 20 minutes. That, that, that means the change of the number of proteins in a cell through the gene expression, that's over 20 minutes. And then you have processes that take days, uh, and that's about it. There's very few, well, that, that if you think of uh, um, kind of collections, uh, so ecologies are, uh, in the living world uh, that, that can be that can have uh, time scales of, uh, of months, years, uh, or, or even longer. I've neglected so far evolution, which is another side with its, with its own time scales, and that's measured in generations. And that's that's how the genetic code gets changed, and then through interaction you select uh, uh, the organisms that actually succeed. So so all of this is complicated, and also stochasticity was mentioned before. It's true that at the molecular level you have a noise which is uh, due to number. Uh, you then, through those systems of differential equations that were alluded to, you also have other ways of creating, uh, kind of triggering instabilities. So you, so you can have the deterministic system which still is, is chaotic or has other ways to, to bifurcate and, uh, and, and, and take decisions. Anyway, it's the length scales and the time scales that I wanted to bring up because um, depending on what you're trying to understand in a living system, uh, you'll be working uh, uh, in between two scales. You have one scale where you understand something and you try to control the behavior, at, uh, the emergent behavior at the higher scale, or you'll be making observation at the higher scale in the attempt to understand something at the lower scale. But in, in living systems, what I've told you up to now is that there are many, many layers uh, in, of time scales and also length scales uh, that are at play. That's what makes biology really complicated, but once you starts reducing things, uh, then you, you can bring it to the language uh, of uh, physical science uh, or engineering uh, more and more. And uh, what's been happening in biology in the last few years is that the data has become really nice uh, at, at many of these levels uh, that, that I've alluded to. And that's brought in uh, a lot more people who are used to working with uh, physical systems, um, uh, physicists in particular. OK. so. Uh, light is a great tool to investigate cells. Uh, it's it's a uh, it didn't it, it, obviously it, it's it's good for length scales um, um, from very big uh, down down to um, about a quarter of a micron. So you won't see a single protein with light, uh, except if you play tricks like uh, making that protein emit its own light um, by fusing it with a a, a protein that em uh, that emits light. In which case you can actually localize even. Uh, objects that are below the diffraction limit of light. So, so it's, it's the tool of choice for, uh, for a, a lot of um, uh, lab biology uh, imaging and generally the interactions with light. And what we've been learning in the last few years is that it's crucially important to, in, in many questions, to get down to uh, uh, un understanding the, the differences between in individual cells. Um, this, this is true, for example, if you, if you have a tumor then the, the cells within that tumor will, will not be all the same because ev evolution is, and, and differentiation of cells is happening very fast in, in, in tumor growth. And, and there's many other examples in which to, to understand actually what's going on, you, you need, you need to, to have uh, the individuals at the cell level. So, so in volumes of about 10 microns by 10 microns by 10 microns, uh, you would need to know how many proteins 
of the, the relevant proteins, their, their number, for example, or where they're localized uh, in a cell, uh, or how much gene expression is happening of a, of a particular gene that is, is, uh, is affecting the behavior of those cells. So phenotyping is the general word for a kind of um, measuring reliably a certain behavior, uh, so giving it some, some metric. Um, and uh, one wants to do often uh, uh, single cell phenotyping uh, without sacrificing uh, throughput. Um, Maybe that you want to measure all the cells in a community, or, or it may be that um, you've been given a collection of cells, say, from the blood of a human, and only one in a few will, will, will be the, the cancer cell, and you've got to probe many of them to, to actually get, get down to the, to the important one that, that you want to detect and measure. Um, so, so there's a challenge of uh, kind of automating things, um, uh, there's a challenge of also being precise in, in, the, in the, uh, both in the hardware and in the quantifying. Uh, there's challenges of controlling the cell environment that I'll come to in the, briefly in the second part of my talk. Generally, um, a, a lot of uh, imaging in biology has uh, rotated around a, a human being lo looking down a, a monocle. Uh, so that's from 17th century to 18th century, 19th century. But, but even until, uh, uh, say, the early years of this century, uh, making a digital video involved uh, an acquisition card and a huge pain, and, uh, and people, by and large, uh, make observations uh, by eye and, and record things in lab books. And um, uh, that also meant that all the instruments, kind of, uh, uh, still today, in many labs, um, they, they look like um, just small evolutions um, from, from, from this instrument here. They're still designed with, uh, with, with the potential for somebody to look down into the sample. And this, of course, is not the way you build a, a machine if you're just exploiting computers and, uh, and modern imaging sensors. So, uh, kind of, as you all know better than me, digital imaging really boomed um, in the last uh, 15, years, 15 years or so, and, and, and there's been just amazing progress of CCD sensors and CMOS sensors. So, so today, obviously, all the images are grabbed digitally, and uh, so, so this, is, this is, our, is our instrument today in the lab to do, to, to do microscopy on cells, and it's a hybrid. It's a bit like a Tesla car. It, it still looks like the old car, but it's an electric car, and uh, I'm sure electric cars will have their own features which are optimized around really being electric cars in the not-too-distant future. So, so this is a transition instrument. Um, it does, it does yeah, use the computer a lot, Images are grabbed into a powerful workstation, and uh, about 300 times a second, we can, uh, we can do image processing uh, on the stream of images that come in. We can do edge detection, segment objects, work out what's going on, and uh, feedback into, uh, into all the gadgets that you see on this optical bench. We can basically feedback to, to temperature, to the microfluidic control, which is basically pumping liquids into where the cells are. Um, we can change the illumination based on what the cells are doing. This is very important because cells actually suffer very often through, through the exposure to light, and you want to uh, hit them with, the, with, your, with your probe lights only at the moments when they're doing uh, the, the process that is of your interest. So you, you might want to monitor them with a very low light and then hit them with all the light which is required for fluorescence imaging only at the right time. So, so these things can now, well, through the work of the last 10 years, we've basically automated this sort of process, which is it's already a big step because we, we almost never peer down these, uh, these, these uh, kind of these binoculars to, to, to see by anything by eye. Uh, everything is happening uh, through the computer and, and uh, with this potential for feedback, which is basically replacing what the person would normally do by, by, by checking behavior of the biological system and doing the right actions at the right time. So, <clears throat> so I'm happy of this. And, um, and it has um, led to, to new experiments. Uh, there, there's still all these things in red which are not good. It, it's, it's because this was the first time that we were building something new. This is actually the result of many years of work, um, mainly of Yuri Kotter, who is pictured here. Um, it's also led to something which is kind of still unique and customized. It's very difficult to, to give to anyone else because it's all built around, uh, say, one particular stand. We have to reverse engineer kind of the, the Nikon protocols to, to make that work. Um, it's, it's massively expensive because we had to buy kind of commercial bits and then kind of work around to make them work. And all those bits uh, had been originally designed for, a, for a human work, not to be controlled by the computer necessarily. So in that sense, this is, 
it allows us to do the science, but, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's only a step in the direction that uh, I, I think things are going. Um, and yet, a lot of what we've built, uh, we, we think, can, can be miniaturized and, and taken to, to a next level. Well, this is just a zoom in of uh, one of the devices in which we grow cells. Again, this, was, uh, this, is a, this is basically called three well plates. And here we control the, temp the temperature, um, the, the gas flowing in, also which is uh, thermally controlled. We, we heat slightly the top surface so that there's no condensation. And these are all kind of the tricks that one has to build in order to do good microscopy and to let it go, say, overnight or over a weekend without having to, to be there to kind of keep the thing going. This is a different uh, instrument, which we also partially automated for uh, <coughs> growth of uh, red blood cells in connection to malaria parasites invading them. And this has its own challenges because it's an experiment that has to last uh, several days the, because the malaria parasites grow over a whole cycle of 48 hours. So, so again, it has to be very stable. OK, so, so the stuff that we've learned there in the last 10 years, we, we, we now want to kind of pour it forward and, and miniaturize and make low cost and, um, and spread out and standardize. Um, <clears throat> these are themes that you also heard previous speakers talk about, particularly Jim. And in fact, uh, we've had many conversations with him too. But this particular, uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of ideas and, and prototypes. This uh, 3D printed microscope is the work of Richard Bowman, who is now an academic in, in Bath. And um, it, it's, uh, you may have seen it because it's been uh, publicized and used already by, by several people. Uh, so, so recently, we, we, we tried to imagine how uh, a battery of uh, 20 or 100 of these uh, would, uh, would help us with the malaria work. And um, we're trying to obtain funding still on this. Um, so the loading of samples here would still be manual. But then this painful kind of wait of one or two days uh, could really be made um, into, into I mean, parallelized into, into 20 or 100 because these things uh, cost uh, a, a tiny fraction of what the Nikon stand uh, costs. And the image quality that comes out is, is, is very comparable. However, you then have another kind of bottleneck, which is the, the image processing, which at that point, if you're having 100 streams of data uh, with images taken several times a second, uh, really, really has to be automated. You can't, can't possibly imagine a human intervening to to, to either make the segmentations, detect contacts, measure sizes and stuff. Um, and the data would be so big that you can't even imagine a human curating errors and, and checking for, uh, for, for, for errors systematically. So, so connected to this, there's a, there's a challenge of uh, Im computer vision and image analysis um, uh, that is scaled up compared to, to working with a single stream where you can still expect the human to, to, to do some checks. Uh, here, if you're thinking 100 microscopes in parallel, there, there can be no human checks. Um, there's one vision, so, so moving towards uh, the lowest possible cost in an effort to, to, kind of to, to parallelize up with, with the challenges that I described. If we kind of take two steps <coughs> of, uh, of science fiction uh, ahead, then this is a vision uh, that we shared with, uh, with Emre. We tried to get funding recently, and I think we're still pursuing uh, to some extent. Uh, and here, here the idea is to scale down. So, so okay, so this object is um, still has a, a microscope objective there, and it's it's about the size of a of a big Rubik cube. If you entered from the top there, um, this this object would be even smaller. So we're thinking here, this this is the size of a microscope slide, uh, so about two centimeters by by three or four, and we try to imagine. Um, if we were really starting from scratch, so, so this, is, this has some legacy in it. So this object here is the microscope objective uh, that you would still see in there. Let's see. OK, here it's hidden uh, under here. And that in itself has uh, basically design rules that, still, that, that are designed uh, for, 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 in the end, for the image to be the size of, hum of a human eye. So, so you, still, you still find human constraints even, um, even in that design. Here we try to think, if we're really starting totally from scratch, we, we, we're only going to kind of base things on the fact that a CMOS sensor, sensor is going to pick up things, then how would we do it? Um, the lens could be much, much simpler. It, it could look a lot more like uh, the lens in a smartphone. Um, and we could, do, we could automate kind of error correction and, and optical corrections uh, and, still, uh, and, and get very good quality through that. We could integrate 
<clears throat> we're going to talk a bit about microfluidics and show you what it really means. But we can basically integrate uh, channels into this uh, modular uh, layered device. Uh, these channels can be opened and closed, potentially. The technology exists to do that with using soft rubbers and kind of pressing down on the rubber. Uh, and there'll be kind of control units that, that control that. And uh, uh, illumination will be very simple because of the compactness. And uh, we would uh, imagine having um, online um, pre-processing because, again, now, now these would be, you could imagine, uh, another scale down in, uh, in cost uh, because there's nothing, there's nothing very high quality here. And, and in fact, many of the components will be from, from mass markets. So, so, so these, you can imagine having thousands of them for the cost of one uh, imaging device to, uh, of the ones we have in the lab today. Um, OK, so, so th actually, so this is just a, this is a vision, because we, we can't yet build this. Um, I'm going to take a step back and show you. So, so this is, uh, I took you along the line of uh, imaging uh, and where we want to go with that. I'm going to take a step back and tell you a little bit about uh, how we actually have to handle cells in order to, to do many of these experiments, again, in a generic fashion. So, so this is true of basically cell biology work, which, which means a big, deal, big fraction of, uh, of biology. Uh, it's also true if you think of personalized medicine. Um, if, if you have, say, a cancer patient who's receiving chemotherapy, um, then what one would want to do is, is, is take a, few, a biopsy or a few cells uh, from the patient and, and quickly, tech, uh, qu quickly test different therapies um, because uh, patients react differently to, 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 to the same drugs and even the same patient might react differently as, as uh, things go or, or depending on uh, other kind of conditions that, that the person has. So, so, <clears throat> it's, so it's, it's true even in the clinical context that you would uh, in the end do a lot of uh, uh, phenotyping of cells. It may not always be imaging, uh, but, but a lot of the assays um, uh, what work through imaging. So, so, so this is another challenge that has a lot of technology in itself. Um, how do you handle things? Uh, so here I'm going to show you very briefly a video. So following a similar kind of um, paradigm as before, th there are people who are taking the existing technologies. Ah, it's not working. It's not showing you the um, YouTube stream. OK, we'll go back to wonder why. OK, the, the YouTube video I was going to show you is uh, a system they have at Luxembourg University, where um, they've, built a, they, they've robotized um, a, whole, um, a whole warehouse, essentially, with, with the robot arms picking up the, the cell culture dishes from, from incubators, taking them to a microscope. The, the microscope works as a microscope, and, and the whole thing is on a, kind of an assembly line. And that's OK, but that's, again, the spirit of um, trying to automate uh, with, with the instruments and, and the standards that have been built for, for, for essentially human handling. And, and that, that for sure is not the most efficient uh, way of doing things. So, so one thing we, <clears throat> that I again want to kind of uh, show you today, and uh, I think is, is going to be the way that things are done more and more, is, is scaling down and going to these uh, kind of microfluidic devices and having channels to, to move cells about. Um, so I'll show you now uh, a few examples of current work. Um, so with bacteria, and particularly rod-like bacteria, so uh, <coughs> there's a, a model organism, E. coli, which we also have in our gut, but also is uh, one of the workhorses in, uh, in, uh, kind of, uh, a, a, as a model system in, in biology. It's rod-like, has <coughs> quite well-defined size and shape. And similarly, Salmonella, which is an, an interesting pathogen, and uh, Bacillus and others uh, also can be grown this way. You can basically grow these things in, uh, in single file, in very thin uh, kind of straw, straw micro channels, which are just one micron in, uh, in width and, and several microns in length. And then uh, there's no space for the bacteria to overtake each other, but they can push each other out. By out, I mean that there's uh, two loading channels above and below here. And the bacteria, as they grow, they kind of push the, the, the outer ones uh, into the exhaust. And you can maintain this thing with, with uh, kind of nutrients, foods going in. Um, almost indefinitely for, 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 for days. And these things have a generation time of 20 minutes. So you can follow hundreds of generations uh, of, of this loaded device. And uh, imaging, you can probe uh, um, phenotypes, so information from, from each cell uh, over, over its lifetime. OK, so suffice it to know that um, 
an important, very important phenotyping thing that you want to do with these bacteria is measure uh, the amount of fluorescence. So, so here they've been genetically modified so that uh, uh, the protein of interest is coming out together with a, a, a protein which is fluorescent by measuring how much fluorescent protein you have, you're quantifying uh, another protein of interest. Um, uh, kind of similar channels, but slightly bigger, um, can be used to hold yeast cells. So yeast is good for making beer and bread. And again, it's a, it's a model uh, organism in, bio in biology. And here we were testing uh, the effects of geometric confinement, so corners on these yeast cells. And uh, so the good news with biology, I told you a lot about the bad news. So one of the good, good pieces of news is that it recycles machinery across many organisms. And uh, something that looks very different from a mammalian cell, such as a yeast cell, in fact, uh, reacts similarly to, to, to mammalian cells, which are more important for us, uh, for example, to confinement. This is a completely different system. This is an algae, a single cell algae um, that we started looking at uh, with uh, Alison Smith, who is a colleague of Jim's in plant sciences. Um, the, the, the hope here was, um, again, to, to be able to watch single cells. So each of these circles is a cell. And, and this is a channel. It's a big channel. So these are now 10, 10 microns, roughly, in, in size. This is a bigger channel with, with cages. And flow is coming from, from left to right to be able to follow these things over their cell cycle. Uh, and the problem here is that the cell cycle of these algae cells is several days. So this um, has led us to, to develop um, a standalone microscope, because otherwise we're sacrificing our high-end microscope forever, uh, focusing on these cells. And we also had to invent this way of having cages, <clears throat> because these cells grow in, dia grow in diameter during their life, and, uh, and then segment up into daughter cells, which then disperse out. Um, so, so the idea of uh, channels doesn't work well for, for this sort of uh, spherical cell. Um, so, so, so I showed you macrophytics to, to deliver cell and to hold them. So, so holding over a long time and being able to image the same cell is, is, is a big deal in, in, in many situations. Um, this slide is showing you how we can, uh, another way in which we can move cells about uh, apart from flow. Um, you can use a, a focused uh, laser beam to, 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 to uh, which through the, the forces that come from uh, diffraction of light um, uh, uh, exerts enough for us to, to, mo to move a cell about in, in a liquid. Uh, it's called laser tweezers. And in this image, I'm showing you uh, how malaria parasite, this small round thing here, is uh, brought up to a red blood cell uh, and then kind of sticks and in this case actually invades uh, the cell. This is the process that uh, malaria parasites do in the blood of uh, people who've uh, received uh, malaria from a mosquito. This looks a bit like this. So <clears throat> laser tweezers, again, up to now, has been a very kind of labor-intensive manual uh, experiment with uh, people kind of uh, po uh, well, through the computer, but, but essentially manually steering things and moving things about. But, but, but it's another technology which is uh, ripe for kind of feedback and just uh, automation. Um, this is again, this is, this is the present, and the future might be tidier. This is the present of how we want to grow um, layers of, uh, of cells uh, that are as similar as possible to the endothelium, so to the internal uh, wall of a, of a vasculature. And we're doing this. Um, again, to, to then flow blood cells and study how they stick to, to, to the cells of the, of the vessel. So, so here we have a, a big pump to, to do a perfusion system. And um, what we found is that it's very important to, to grow the cells uh, in the presence of flow, because, uh, because they, they basically form the, the, the correct tissue with the right alignment only if, uh, if they're grown for a few days in the presence of a flow that mimics um, what, what happens in, in, a, in a body, physiologically. So that in itself is then the starting point for many experiments. Um, this is an experiment where we, we're studying the sticking of red blood cells that are invaded by malaria, uh, sticking to this uh, endothelium that we've grown in, in, in on the surface of channels. Um, th this is one of the biggest projects in my lab, and it relates to cells that we have in the airways. Uh, our airways, um, as you know, when you have to cough, uh, are, are making mucus. 
and this mucus is constantly being pushed uh, up away from the lungs and into your digestive tract. And uh, this keeps the, the, the airways clean, and so you can breathe dust and pathogens, etc. And, and uh, almost all the time, nothing bad happens to you. Um, it's, it's moved, this mucus, uh, by uh, these, these thin uh, microscopic, about 10 micron long uh, and um, 200 nanometer thin um, uh, motile filaments that are called motile cilia. And there's a, there's a whole carpet of them. And they all beat a bit like a Mexican wave of people at a stadium. Uh, they beat in making a wave. And this wave is constantly kind of pushing mucus up. There's, of course, uh, diseases where, where this doesn't work too well. So, so these are reconstructed shapes from, from Sidon videos of, um, of what this is a healthy uh, cilium, which is doing, it's basically doing a nice broad uh, sweep, which, which pushes mucus. And then imagine a whole carpet of these. The, the unhealthy one is doing a much reduced um, stroke, and, and uh, so that, that comes from um, a genetic disease uh, that affects the, or the machinery that, that bends the cilium. Now, there's a, there's a big physics question here, which is um, uh, how can we even measure uh, the synchronization of cilia? So to, to get a good Mexican wave, you need um, people at the stadium over a long, long space to, to be acting together. Here, here uh, the individual blobs are cells, so, so this, is a, this is about a millimeter, and uh, this is just uh, our uh, cell culture in, in the lab, where there isn't a, a big synchronization across. And it's a very fuzzy video, and it's, it's difficult to, to well, what you see is flickering, but what we really want to extract from this sort of uh, kind of flicking dynamics is um, over what length scale is, uh, are these beating synchronized. So this is perhaps the only piece of information I'll give you in my talk today. It's, it's a new algorithm that we, we just came out with uh, to, to get precisely this scale of synchronization. And I think this will be interesting to any of you doing computer vision, because it's a, it's a powerful generic alg algorithm that doesn't necessarily have to be applied on uh, motile cilia or even to cells. It's, it's much more generic. So what do we do to, to, to do that? We, we definitely don't want to go searching for features. We don't want to segment. <coughs> And, uh, but, but we still want to retain time information and space information. So, so a powerful way to go about is uh, to subtract each frame with every other frame. Uh, thus, say, if I have uh, 1,000 frames, I, I now, I've now got a, a million pairs of because every frame minus every other frame. But I can then average all the frame differences that have the same time interval. So I go back to 1,000, a stack of 1,000, because I've got the interval one, the interval two, the interval three, et cetera. And then um, you can imagine if, I, if I've taken uh, frames that are very close to each other, so an interval of one, uh, and I've subtracted, then my signal will be very close to zero because nothing much has moved. But if the time intervals are bigger, more stuff has moved if, if there's dynamics in the video. So that's true up to a point. If you, if you wait um, more than a big lag time, Stuff has moved in the video, but all the all the confirmations have been explored, and uh, so so you, you get a signal that grows and saturates if you wait long enough in this sort of um, frame subtraction that I've just uh, described. Now the clever thing is um, uh, to analyze the subtracted frame in Fourier space, so to look at the Fourier modes, and that means searching for uh, how how the signal grows in the subtracted frame for for each length scale. The Fourier transform kind of selects out a length scale. And uh, if you do that, you get a time scale for a signal to grow that depends on length scale. And the short length scales grow fast. That means the stuff has moved over a short scale quickly. The, 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 the Fourier modes that correspond to long space take longer to, to grow and saturate. Now, from how the time scale depends on the length scale, you get a lot of information from this process. And there's been no thresholding, no segmentation, no nothing. Just that the video as it is has been fed into Fourier transforms. You can, for example, distinguish whether motion is, uh, is just random or if it's directed motion. Or if there are vortices or things that have a, a scale, uh, you will see that uh, in the trends of the time scale versus uh, the length scale. Yes, uh, both almost finished. For the cilia, which oscillates, we get oscillating signals. And by doing this analysis on uh, tiles of different size, that's how we get the synchronization scale out with, without any, any user input. So we get a sigmoid that, as a function of the tile size at which we work, gives us uh, the, the, the coherence uh, scale. 
So my last slide before I, before I finish is to, to tell you that um, uh, kind of a, a lot of this emphasis towards low cost and towards uh, kind of building your own instruments, etc., uh, also requires community building. So um, I have four images here. So, so the, thing, the thing on the left is um, is a kind of a do-it-ourselves instrument that's working with a, a yo-yo board. This is a very nice way to connect a smartphone into the physical world. Um, came out of Google Labs, but Spark, Spark Fun uh, sells it. It's very cheap. This is a picture of um, a workshop where uh, <coughs> we were uh, telling, show, showing people how to get started with the Raspberry Pi Arduino uh, combos. Um, it was done through the sensors um, uh, CDT, which is, is a doctoral training program with which uh, you can engage. Uh, it's based in chemical engineering in Cambridge. This is an image from um, a workshop uh, that I've been running the last five years. It's uh, surrounded by a UNESCO center, and uh, it tries to push these ideas towards uh, uh, the scientific community in developing countries. So you realize that low cost, it's a big deal to us because we can go high throughput, but it's an even bigger deal to somebody who can't even do an experiment unless it's low cost. Um, and this is an image, uh, so we're now trying to get the university students engaged as early as possible. And we're running events um, to, for the first year physicists and in engineering, and they're doing something similar uh, with the first years. Um, so I hope my kind of collection of random thoughts uh, triggered ideas. Um, and I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.